TorahCafe.com. So there's this Irishman who walks into a pub, a bar, in Dublin, Ireland, and he orders three pints of Guinness, which is a beer, and he sits in the back of the room, and he drinks a sip out of each one in turn. One, two, three, one, two, three. And the bartender goes over to him and says, you know, the pints, they'll go flat. Why don't you just order one, drink it, then come back and get another one off tap and drink it. Take three at one time, and they're going to go flat. So he says, no, you've got to understand. He goes, I, uh, me, I'm one of three brothers. He goes, one of them moved off to the United States of America. The other's in Australia. I'm here in Dublin. Once upon a time, we used to sit and we used to drink together all the time. But now that they've moved off, one to the States and one to, to Australia, so we each have this ritual where we go into our local pubs and we order three beers and we relive the experience as though we like the good old times. And that's the way it went on. And everybody got used to this quirky habit. And it went on like that for months, years. And then one day he comes into the pub and he only orders two beers. And he sits down. The whole pub goes completely quiet. And finally the bartender goes over to him and he says, Sir, I just really want to extend my condolences to you for your loss. And the man thinks a moment, it's Irishman, he says, huh, what? Oh, no, 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 sir. These two beers over here, they're for my two brothers. Me, I've given up drinking. <laughs> you know, if there's one thing that the terrible conflict in Israel has brought to the fore, not that we didn't know it before, but it has brought it to the fore, it is the way that Jewish people are essentially connected at the core. It's not like we are Americans who are also Jewish, or Canadians who are also Jewish, or English or British who are also Jewish. We are first and foremost Jewish, and then subject to our particular geographical location, we are either British Jews, or American Jews, or Canadian Jews, or what have you. And the relevance of this is that when something happens, in any one place, we invariably feel it someplace else. Like a family member, however far away, if something happens to a loved one, wherever and however far they may be, it doesn't lessen the impact. It doesn't diminish the tragedy. The fact that they are a loved one makes you feel the pain all the same. And I suggest to you, I don't believe for a second that there is a people so universally bound as the Jewish people. That's a hard fact. We could be sitting in a bar drinking alone, but I have a brother in the United States and another one in Ireland, another one in Israel, or wherever it is, and the hard fact is if they're drinking, they're drinking with me. Each time a rocket was fired, doesn't matter where we were sitting, wherever it might have been in the world, we suddenly sat there with anxiety and with pain. Each time a soldier was killed, it doesn't matter where we were sitting in whichever part of the world, we shed a tear. When U.S. lone soldier Max Steinberg was killed in combat, 30,000 people turned out for his funeral, 99% of them never even having known that he existed beforehand. Are there a people like that anywhere in the world? And here's the problem. Historically, our strength was always in our unity. One nation is our strength. Scattered and divided is our Achilles heel. You know, the cardinal sin, we all know this, of the first temple was idolatry. We committed idolatry. We were exiled for 70 years. The temple was destroyed. And then thereafter, we returned. The cardinal sin of the second temple era was baseless hatred, the lack of unity. And we've been in exile ever since. Idolatry is a capital sin, a capital crime, no less. But when committing idolatry, you are effectively offending God. And frankly, he can get over it. But when there is this sort of baseless hatred between one another, well, we all know, and we can all relate to the distinction as parents. If somebody offends you, well, yeah, you can get past it. 
But if somebody comes along and offends your kids, imagine someone comes over to you and says, I just want you to know I really like you. It's just your kid I can't stand. How would that make you feel? When there's internal strife, Jew fighting against Jew, brother turning against brother, sister against sister, then God withdraws somewhat, creating a void, if you like, that enables the enemy to fill the vacuum. One most telling place where that is evident is in a little detail at the end of the book of Deuteronomy, at the end of the book of Numbers of Bamidbar. The Torah in the final portion there recounts all of the journeys that took place in the desert and it highlights some of the occurrences as they transpired in those places and within that it suddenly just mentions one little detail. Just follow me a little bit on this. It tells us about one particular stop where at that point Aaron the high priest died at that place and in the very next verse it suddenly tells us how the king of Canaan came to wage war. What's the significance of the juxtaposition? Well, you know, the Talmud tells us that we had specific gifts on account of three greats. We had the well of water on account of Miriam. We had the clouds of glory on account of Aaron the high priest, and we had the manna on account of Moshe. And when each one of those passed away, these things disappeared. When Miriam died, the well went away. When Moshe passed away, the manna stopped as they went into Israel. When Aaron passed away, the clouds of glory also went with him. But there is a deeper underlying significance to each of these special gifts and their relationship with each of the individuals. Why was there this gift of clouds of glory in specific on account of Aaron? Who was Aaron the high priest? What was his unique trait? We're told he was somebody who loved peace and who pursued peace. Our rabbis and ethics of the fathers enjoin us to be like the disciples of Aaron, love peace and pursue peace. Do you know when he passed away, the Torah tells us, the entire Jewish nation mourned over his loss. It doesn't say that about any of the others, even about Moses. Why? Because he made it his life's mission to bring peace between every single Jew. And thus, when he passed away, everybody, husband and wife, friends, everybody suddenly felt that immense loss. Everybody felt the impact of somebody who was always there to bring stability amongst them now no longer being there. So here's the point. The mana always fell proportionate to the particular individual. If you were a righteous person, the mana fell on your doorstep. If you were less righteous, you had to go a little further out to collect it. There was disparity. The water, again, you had to draw a kind of line using your stick to draw the water from the well to yourself. Again, disparity. But the clouds of glory, they protected collectively over all of the Jewish people as one entity. No disparity, no differentiation. It was only collectivity. And everybody was there protected under the same cloud with the same level of protection. And therefore, those clouds were there in the merit of Aaron, who himself always sought out this unique quality amongst the people. So therefore, the commentaries explain that when Aaron passes away, the cloud is removed. The protection is seemingly no longer there. And that is what enables the king of Canaan to now suddenly start up and head out towards the Jewish people and try to wage war against them. That's on one level. But I suggest to you something altogether different. Because Aaron himself was somebody who always actively pursued peace, and there was a greater unity present, always in his presence, than with his passing, who's there to be the peacekeeper? And therefore, there is a subtle element of decrease in the levels of unity as they existed. And once the unity starts to fragment, well, that enables again the void, the vacuum, and for the enemy to step in enabling the Canaanites to fill that moment. It's ripe for attack. By the way, you want to know how Aaron used to keep the peace? He used to go around to different people who he knew were quarreling. So you had Reuven and Shimon, and they weren't talking to each other, as we might be able to relate to. And he'd go over to Reuven and he says, you know, I want you to know that Shimon, he feels terrible about your spat. And he really truly wants to make up. So, you know, next time you see him, keep that in mind. Then he'd go to Shimon and he'd say, you know, Ruvain, he feels miserable. He hasn't slept in weeks because of your dispute. 
and he feels really bad about it. So when you see him, you should keep that in mind. And then, of course, imagine psychologically when Reuven and Shimon suddenly meet up with each other, invariably they're now going to suddenly realize and think, oh, the other guy really wants to make up with me, and they make up. Question is this, the Rebbe asks, so is Aaron guilty of lying? I mean, did Reuven really have sleepless nights? Did Shimon really feel that so terrible or whatever? And the Rebbe answers very simply, at the core, every Jew always wants to do what is right. At the core, deep down, on the level of the neshama, on the level of the soul, every Jew wants to get along with every other Jew. Every Jew feels inextricably linked with every other Jew. So on the surface, we allow the pettiness and the stupidities to get in the way. And we allow for that to create these little mountains, these little molehills that emerge into mountains. And we don't speak to each other, we fight, whatever, but at the core? So that's all Aaron was doing. He was exposing what was really going on on the level of the soul at the core. And by the way, if you want to know how far the power of unity extends itself, consider a very curious verse in Hosea which tells us Ephraim, that was the tribe of Ephraim, is joined to idols, leave him alone. And the sages observe over here that on the one hand, the tribe of Ephraim are committing idolatry. But nevertheless, even because they, even as they are involved in idolatry, tragic though that may be, they are joined. There is unity, and therefore leave him alone. They won't come to serious harm from their sins. They will wage wars and they will be victorious. That's not a sanctioning of idolatry in any way whatsoever. But unity always serves as the ultimate saving grace. It goes a considerable way to serve as saving grace. Only when unity is broken can a decree calling for annihilation be allowed in heaven. And ironically, it is only when we are at our most vulnerable, when the enemy is weighing in, when the Hamans of this world threaten annihilation, and Jews suddenly come together and they rekindle their sense of nationhood. My problem is, I mean, what was it Queen Esther? What was her first instruction to Mordechai with the threat of Haman? all that earlier time on. She said to him, Lech kenosis kol hayehudim, go and gather all of the Jewish people. Doesn't matter what background they're from. Before the fasting, before the praying, before the beseeching from on high, before talking to God, before doing all that stuff, first and foremost, kenos, gather kol hayehudim, bring them together, because that's the only way that we can withstand the Hamans of this world and the Hamas of this world and what have you. You know, I remember I was leading a, a birthright group right at the onset of the Lebanon War several years ago. And we were confined, of course, at that point to, to the south of land. And I was in Elat, where we were all were at, and I was in this taxi, and the taxi driver suddenly just turns to me and he says, Nazarallah huwa semit svagadola. Nazarallah, the head of the Hezbollah, he's doing a tremendous mitzvah. And I look at him, why on earth is he doing a tremendous mitzvah? And he said, because look, He's uniting the Jewish people because of the war. We're all united together. Isn't that where our problem really lies? It takes for the Hezbollah and it takes for the Hamans and it takes for the Hamas, Yamach Shemam, and whichever other enemy in order to make us join together and unite as one? Why does it take for Israel or for Jews to be under threat before they can put aside their differences and look to bonds together and unite? Why does it take for trauma before people can acknowledge that that which unites us is far greater than that which divides us. Why, after all these years of enduring all kinds of suffering because of our lack of respect for our differences, do we not appreciate, in the first instance, without the anxieties and without the threats and without the concerns, how we have to redress the balance to value one another as human beings, as friends, and above all else, as fellow Jews? Now, dare I say this, but I'll say it. You don't have to go to statistics for this. Anyone who looks into their own hearts, honestly, will know this enough to be true. Prejudice is one of the principal constituents of the human heart. Take a look around this room right now. And I'm going to guarantee you that almost everybody here harbors some kind of prejudice. 
I don't like him because he's too right-wing. I don't like her because she's too left-wing. I don't care much about him because he's Litvish. I don't like her because he's Chabad, because she's Sephardic. The list goes on and on because her nose is too long, because he has funny teeth, because of their views. Take a good hard look into your own heart. And then look at the world around you, what it is and what it could be. And then we have to ask ourselves, are we working on being part of the solution or are we essentially part of the problem? The real problem is this. The real problem is when people take it to extremes. The tendency to turn human judgments into divine commands, as some people do, makes religion one of the most dangerous forces in the world. There may be religious Jews who see those as secular, or acting secularly and immediately write them off as simply not good enough, not deserving in their minds to carry the title Jew, not one of mine. Or, conversely, there are those who are less religiously inclined who look upon someone that may walk with a big black hat or a strimal or a long capota and think of them as being, quote, meshuggah from or what have you. And that's the reality. So we end up with Haredi, shunning Chiloni in Israel, and those who are less from sometimes perhaps mocking what they perceive as the fruma, and that's dangerous stuff. The mere fact that we have these labels, Haredi, Chiloni, from, non from, in and of itself demonstrates how dangerous judgmental religion can be. And to be honest with you, I never fully appreciated how judgmental we have become. Until recently, when I was dealing with a shidduch, a match, somebody called me up to inquire about a particular boy for a certain girl and then asked me the following question. What sort of yarmulke does he wear? <laughs> and I have to admit, for somebody who's rarely lost for words, that question blew me away. I got completely caught off guard and I just simply replied with, excuse me? And the woman repeats, you know, is it small? Is it knitted? Is it suede? Is it velvet? Is it black or is it colored? And then it occurred to me, never mind that we decide who is a good Jew or not a good Jew based on where, what, and whatever else. Now we're deciding the status of a Jew based on when, where, or how often they wear their yarmulke. But even more than that, now it's just a question of style. Now it's a question of positioning. And to add insult to injury, maybe even also what sort of clips you use with it. So for example, suede and knit yarmulkes means you're modern orthodox but then only when you wear it closer to the front of your head, about two <laughs> inches from your hairline. If you wear it further back, then you're old school orthodox, probably over 40. However, if you use silver clips, then many people, or hair grips or whatever you call them, then many people will avoid eating in your house because then they assume that you have no experience wearing a yarmulke, and therefore you need to bring in these reinforcements to hold it down. So bobby pins are a safer bet. But that, too, depends on also how many you use. And then there's the black velvet clip-free yarmulke bearers who, well, what that means is basically you're as holy as Moses himself. <laughs> and I've always wondered, based on all those labels, when I wear a blue yarmulke, which is kind of not black, not suede, not colored, somewhere in the middle of my, I'm not sure where that leaves me, but that's another conversation. Amos Oz, the famous Israeli novelist, tells a story about a particular episode that transformed his life when he was a mere eight years old. He had a father, Yehuda, who was a very gifted author, a very gifted man. He was able to read 16 languages and speak in 11 of them. A brilliant scholar, but because there was only one university in Israel at the time, never amounted to a whole lot more than, than being the, the um, university librarian. But he dedicated so much of his spare time and energy to writing a book. It took years and eventually was published a literary study entitled The Novella in Hebrew Literature. And he's excited at the book's publication. And every day he would go to the local bookstore to see the three copies that they had on display to see when they would be sold. And then after a while, disappointment started to creep in because the three books were still sitting there. It's not exactly something that was a particular fascination to the masses. And down the block, he had a very good friend, a famous novelist called Israel Zarchi, 
whose books sold always very well. And Amos remembers how his father was once lamenting to this friend, Zarchi, telling him how, look, you know, your books, they're novels, they're fiction, and people are buying them all the time. Is for years I spent checking every little footnote, every nuance, everything I'm putting into my book, and nobody's interested in them. Nobody's, and nobody's buying them. And then the days pass, and no copies are being bought, and Amos observes how his father Yehuda is becoming more and more despondent. And then one day, he comes into the house like a big celebration, and he's looking so upbeat and so uplifted. They've all sold out, every single book, all of them, here or today on the same day. And he took the whole family out for dinner, except he took his wife, rather, out. He told Amos, you go stay by my friend Israel Zarchi while we're out for dinner and we're going to celebrate. And when Amos, little young eight-year-old Amos Oz at the time, was sitting in Israel Zarchi's house, and he goes into the little living room over there in the small apartment, he notices four books of his father, the four copies of his father's book sitting over there. And he knew one was obviously that which his father had given to his friend, and the other three, well, it was clear to him what this friend had done. And of course, Israel Zarchi himself, he went and he quickly took the other three copies and put them in an office desk drawer so that no one else should know of them. And then he cast a glance at the young little Amos as though to say, this stays between us. He was eight years old, he writes, but I felt a rush of gratitude inside me that brought tears to my eyes. And he says more than that. More than 50 years later in his own memoirs, he never disclosed that detail until both his father and the Zarchi had since passed away. But he says, here I am 50 years on and I'm still in deep awe of Zarchi's kindness. And he says, I can count two or three writers amongst my best friends, friends who have been so close to me throughout the course of my life for decades. But I'm not certain that any one of them would do for me what Zachi did for my own father. I mean, he says, consider what it must have cost at the time to buy the three books, a tidy sum with which one could have bought much needed clothing for their kids, etc. But that was Zachi's own innovative way in which he showed his love for somebody else. And in our own fast-paced computer age, when technology and science has been catapulting forward in so many leaps and bounds, I think it's fair to say there hasn't been a comparable advance in personal morality and kindly behavior. But to put it differently, humanity's increase in altruism has not kept pace with scientific progress. And we need to, like this Zarchi, use our own smarts, our own intelligence, to devise new, creative, and innovative ways in which we can go out and help another person. To use our imaginations that much more to discover new ways of being able to demonstrate loving care and reaching out to others. Because that's what holds our nation together and keeps us strong, both physically and spiritually. You know, there was a group of boys from a yeshiva in Israel who decided to enroll in the rowing team for the 2016 Olympics taking place in Brazil. And they kept on entering a number of competitions now already for the last year, and they keep coming in last. And they don't understand what they're doing, so their own little coach decides to take one of them and sends them off to scout out all the other teams. And he sends them to England, and he comes to Cambridge, the best rowing team in all of the world. And he comes back, and he says, so tell me, what have you learned? What are we doing wrong? And he said, I'll tell you the truth. In Cambridge, they only have one man yelling, and the other nine are rowing. Isn't it the case that we're so sometimes consumed by the petty squabbling, by the infighting, by the little molehills, again, that amount into huge mountains and obstruct the process? In our personal lives, as well as collectively as Am Yisrael, our purpose is to recognize that in our limited time span, we need to do a lot yes, less yelling and a lot more rowing. In Israel, again, there's Haredi and there's secular. In the broader religious world, there's orthodox and there's conservative and there's reform and there's conservadox and there's liberal and there's reconstructionist. In the ultra from world, there are Hasidim and there are Misnagdim. And even in the Hasidic world, there's Lubavitch and there's Satmer and there's Babov and there's Ger, and the list goes on and on. The reality is that God initially only created one man, many animals, a whole lot of planets, loads of vegetation, but only one man. 
Sure, yes, man himself may have decompartmentalized into many men and many women, but essentially we all trace our roots back to one man with one heart. And in that basis, therefore, we are inextricably linked together. Over the years, there are layers that mask over this heart, such that, you know, when you do an ultrasound on a pregnant woman, you determine a multiple birth on the basis of how many heartbeats that the doctor himself will actually pick up in the process. Life's trials and tribulations has resulted in the illusion that there is more than one heartbeat, that there are separate entities, that we are like a multiple birth but we were all created as one man. So where does that leave me? And here we get a little controversial, vis-a-vis -vis recognizing um, other strands of Judaism, if you will, that may not be in conformity with myself. Well, I'll sum it up for you very simply. I gave a lecture some years ago on the very concept of unity, et cetera, et cetera. And I made the point that that which unites us is far greater than that which divides us. And at the end, there was a reform rabbi who challenged me with the following question, why don't you practice what you preach? And I said, I beg your pardon, what do you mean? He says, well, you can get up here and you can wax lyric and you can talk all about the importance of unity, but let's face it, you don't recognize me as a rabbi. You don't recognize me as an authentic and, and appropriate authority and representative of the Jewish nation. And I, I just looked at him and I said, well, okay, true, but admittedly, neither do you recognize me in the same sort of way as well. And he insisted, that's nonsense, that's not true. And I said, well, if that's the case, there's no way you're either hypocritical or you're, or you're a liar, because frankly, there is no way in the world that you could recognize me as a legitimate rabbi or teacher of Judaism. Because if you did so, then you'd be denying everything that you believe in. We have diametrically opposing views on the meaning of God, on the meaning of Revelation, on the meaning of Torah, on the meaning of Judaism as a whole. So if I'm an authentic representative of Judaism as a collective reality, then I have to believe that what you're teaching is essentially false. And alternatively, if you are a legitimate rabbi, then everything I believe in and practice, you have to perceive as false. And grudgingly, he felt compelled to agree. And here we have to stress something loud and clear. We don't believe in labels. Labels are for clothing. So you can have Yves Saint Laurent and Christian Dior and Ralph Lauren or what have you. There really is no such a thing as Orthodox Jews or Reformed Jews or Conservative Jews. All are simply Jews, unqualified in every sense. A Jew is a Jew is a Jew sine qua non. Either you are Jewish or you're not. You could be more observant or less observant, but ultimately everyone born of a Jewish mother or those who convert into the faith are and remain Jews. But respecting one another doesn't mean to respect and legitimize ideas and philosophies which are unacceptable to our own. It means to respect and recognize the humanity and the identity of our fellow beings. And this is so important, but people don't get it. We must never confuse ideas with persons. A person remains my fellow being, like we said, a creature of God like myself, even if his or her philosophy might be perceived as repugnant, not acceptable to me. And this is the key that people find so difficult to make those distinctions. Why is it that people cannot separate the issues from the personalities? You don't like the way I think, you don't agree with my approach, you can still accept me as a person, as an extension of the divine like yourself. Our faces may not be the same. Our thinking may not be the same. But our essence, our hearts, our souls, they are all one the same, beating all together. And the problem is that, you know, when we start pulling on this one heart in different directions, that causes stress. That puts a strain on the heart. And then we're at risk of heart attacks, which runs the obvious risk of killing off the Jewish nation, God forbid. So when my time comes, after 120, God willing, or more, I'd like to think that my epitaph will be that I captioned the phrase, coined the phrase, two Jews, three opinions, one heart. And if more of us can subscribe to that motto, 
then the Jewish world would look altogether different. At the very beginning of our history, twice, not once, but twice, we already had a face-off between Abraham and Lot. Two Jews, as it were, whatever that meant at that point in time. Not once, but twice. The Torah tells us there was a dispute, there was an argument between them. Why? Because one was an economic matter of concern, there was just more practical concern, and the other was an ideological dispute. Difference of approach, difference of attitude. And in both instances, Abraham says to Lot, Al nami tehim iriva, let there not be quarrel between me and between you, because anashim achim anachno, we are, after all, brothers. So yes, there is ideological difference of approach. Yes, we have a different attitude to how we go about living life or whatever it is and how we perceive different things. But nevertheless, we are brothers. Let there not be dispute. Two Jews, three opinions, one heart. You know, there's a very curious story that is told in the Talmud about a rabbi, Rabbi al Lazar, who was once traveling along when he passed a rather homely-looking individual. And the rabbi looked at him and he said, how ugly is this man? And the man, when he heard this insult, suddenly just turned back to the rabbi and he says, go back to the craftsman who made me. By definition, you don't like the product, take it up with the manufacturer. And Rabbi al felt an immediate sense of remorse and he followed the man begging him for forgiveness for miles. And I've got to ask you, ladies and gentlemen, my dear friends, what is happening in this story? Is it conceivable that a righteous rabbi of such great Talmudic stature could be so superficial as to judge another person just based on their external appearance. Could you imagine your rabbi coming into shul one day, Mrs. Silverstein, there's no easy way for me to say this to you, so I'm just gonna come straight out with it. You need a nose job. <laughs> By the way, if the answer to that is yes, I don't wanna know. So if there is such a rabbi that is that you could imagine saying so, but it begs the question, how is it possible for such a great rabbi to be perceiving a situation here on a seemingly such superficial basis. How ugly is this person? And yet, the commentary of the Talmud, Rashi makes two cryptic observations. He tells us, number one, that the rabbi was coming from a study session. And he tells us, number two, that this so-called ugly man was really Elijah the prophet in disguise. And I think that, therefore, that sheds light on an altogether different perspective on the story. And that is that the rabbi is coming from a study session. You know how it is after coming from shul or coming from a study session or spending five days at the retreat, you feel spiritually elated. You feel uplifted. That's a given. The problem is then when you perceive and see somebody else thereafter who may not be up to that stature, do you develop this kind of holier than thou attitude? And so this rabbi seemingly had that attitude that may not be too uncommon in our world today such that when he's coming from a study session, as Rashi tells us, and he's feeling so spiritually elated, he perceives somebody else, and he's not reflecting on his external appearance. He's reflecting on something going on internally. He sees a man who's null and void spiritually from within, spiritual ugliness, and thus he expresses himself, and he says, how ugly is this man? And it seems he had a little bit of a holier-than-thou attitude, which is why it was necessary for Elijah the prophet to come disguised in this manner in order to teach him a very important lesson. And that lesson is when he said to him, go back to the craftsman who made me. By definition, the craftsman is God himself. I too am a creation of God. Maybe I'm not of the same lofty stature as yourself, but the same craftsman who made you made me as well. I also have a soul. I also have a spirit of God contained within me as well. I too, at the core, am good. So Elijah is coming to teach this rabbi an important lesson that is equally pertinent to every single one of us. And that is the following. And as much as we might pass judgment on other people, and as much as we might use labels by which we might describe other people, and as much as we might see other people who are not up to par with our own spiritual disposition, and thus we label them as ugly or whatever it might be. The hard fact is, you don't know where he's been, you don't know the DNA makeup of his soul. And to use the words of the Alter Rebbe and Tanya, though at first a person might appear to be loathsome and despicable, who can know their true greatness and excellence in their root and source in God? Plain and simply put, look beyond the skin 
deep ugliness and see the good and brilliance beneath. We all know that famous quote from our sages when they tell us, don't judge somebody else until you are in their place. What does in their place mean? Well, on a simple level, it means until you are with their same given set of circumstances. But on a deeper level, it's telling you that even if you do have the same set of given circumstances, you don't know, again, the makeup of his soul. And unless you are of identical disposition, how dare one soul go about judging another? Our missions in life are not the same. Why is somebody failing when we're not failing? You know why? Because that's his area of vulnerability. And we may not be vulnerable in that same specific area. Success is only an achievement for the particular soul faced with the unique challenge. There's nothing remarkable about being able to walk. But when you talk about a person who may be disabled, for him to walk, that's an accomplishment. The problem is, for the man who isn't disabled, to compare his walking to the man who is on crutches, it's not only inappropriate, it's plain and simply foolish. In other words, we criticize other people because we make a judgmental decision about that person's inability to function in comparison to our ability to function in the same given situation. And how unfair is that? It's like expecting a six-year-old to be able to carry a heavy suitcase because it's not heavy for you as an adult. So a fundamental problem with people's inability to deal with one another's failings is that they're measuring that person's failings against their own strengths. The only judge can be God himself because only he knows with what strengths and what weaknesses each soul began. You know, there were these two friends who were walking through the desert when one reached out to the other and he slapped him. And the stunned friend, he didn't say a word, but he immediately wrote in the sand, today my best friend slapped me. A little while later they came across this little oasis in the middle of the desert and this guy reached in to get some water and he fell and he starts to drown and the friend reached out and pulled him out and saved him. And he took a knife and he carved in a stone, today my best friend saved my life. And the other looked at him and says, I don't get it. How come when I smacked you, you wrote it in the sand? And yet thereafter, when you fell into water and I saved you, you wrote it down on stone. To which his friend replied, when somebody hurts you, you know it's his ugly side rearing itself. It's not really him. So write it down in sand where the winds of forgiveness can erase it away. But when somebody does something good for you, that is his true essence expressing itself. That is the innate goodness contained within the inner chambers of the pristine soul. Engrave it in stone where nothing can ever erase it. Could you imagine? Can you imagine how much more our individual and personal relationships would be enhanced if more people assumed that mindset? Can you picture how much more wonderful our communal world would look together if everyone took on such an approach, or how much more beautiful our entire Jewish nation would appear if we all embraced such an attitude. Yes, sure, it's high ground, which of course begs the question, so how do we get there? What's the secret for aiming towards such an attitude? Well, let's look back to that earliest point in time when we were first formed as a nation. And let me preface this with a bit of an anecdote. A man met an angel and he asked the angel, can you show me what is heaven and what is hell? So the angel said, come, I'll show you first hell. And they entered into a room where a group of people were sitting around this huge pot of stew. And everybody sitting there is famished and they're desperate and they're starving. And each one of them held a spoon that reached towards the pot of food in the middle. Only of course the spoon itself had a ladle from which was longer than their own individual arms, so there was no way they can get the spoon back towards their own mouths. He says, okay. He says, now come along with me and I'm going to show you heaven. They come into another room, identical scene as the first. Pot of stew, different group of people, the same long handled spoons. But there everybody looked perfectly happy, perfectly nourished and content. And the man says, I don't understand. 
The same situation. How come they're happy here when they're miserable in the other room and everything is identical? And the angel smiled and he said, it's simple. True, in either room they can't get the spoons back into their own mouths, but in this room they've learned how to feed one another. When the Jews were in Egypt, life was unbearable. Then it was just struggling for survival, survival of the fittest. When they left Egypt and they came to Sinai, the Torah tells us, and he rested there by the mountain. Who's he? The Jewish people. Why then doesn't it say, and they rested there by the mountain? And all the commentaries observe, because at that one moment in time, they all encamped at the mountain like one man with one heart. Something that was never experienced before, and alas, has never been properly experienced since. But the question is this, how did the Jews evolve from such intense individuality from the hell of Egypt, where they were desperate, each man trying to fend and feed his own self, looking after number one, to the bliss that emerges thereafter, the heaven of emancipation, of this unity, of this collectiveness, of this harmony, looking after one another when they stood there at Sinai. How do you make that leap from going from one extreme to the next? And the answer is this. The giving of the Torah at Sinai is referred to as the cosmic marriage where God is the groom and the nation of Israel is the bride and the Torah is the marriage contract. You know, the Mishnah asks a question. When you're at a wedding, how should you dance? How should you dance before the bride? To be clear, the Mishnah is not asking whether you should be doing the hara or the kazatska or the waltz. The question of how, do you, how you should dance before the bride means simply how should you look upon her? What do you say to her? The school of Shammai, in keeping with their more forthright manner, taught, you tell her like it is. If she's pretty, you tell her she's pretty. If not, no, you tell her not. The school of Hillel, true to their softer approach, taught, Kala Nova Hasuda, you have to see every single bride as beautiful. You tell each beautiful bride, each bride how beautiful she looks. To which the school of Shammai counters and says, and what if she's not? Now, when you're going to lie, aren't we cautioned against lying in the Torah? That's a good question. What is the underlying rationale of Hillel? And the answer is, what Hillel is telling you is, that you may not see the bride as beautiful, but the groom certainly does, otherwise he wouldn't be marrying her. For, 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 for the five minutes that you're there, put aside your perspective, your own prejudices, and see the bride from the groom's perspective. Put aside your own personal judgments and see it through the eyes of another person. That's what happened at Sinai. For that one day only, the Jewish nation, with our multitude of complexes, diverse mindsets, different shaped noses, and a myriad of opinions, for that one day we put aside our differences and we saw one another from the groom, God's own perspective. God who peers into the inner recesses of our individual souls and recognizes the inherent beauty common to every one of us. And therein lies our ongoing challenge from that moment till present day. See the other Jew from the groom's perspective, from our supreme groom's perspective who sees the bride as beautiful and so indeed we must see every individual bride, each Jew. Appreciate to be sensitive to another's struggles, to another's dilemmas and challenges. Create space for their position. And bring one another closer to our traditional roots. <laughs> there was a couple. They're on a tight budget, and they're shopping in Costco. You know, I told somebody once that when I go shopping with my wife, we hold hands. And he said, well, that's very romantic. I said, not really, because when I let go, then she suddenly goes out shopping and spending. So this couple, they went to Costco and they're shopping and they departed, as couples do, ending up in their own individual places. And at one point she finds him in the drinks section and he's holding in his hand a case of beer and she says to him, well, what are you doing, honey? And he says, look, it's on sale. A case of 20 for only 10 bucks. So she lovingly takes the drink from his hands and she says chidingly, you know, you don't really need it. It's not on our budget right now. A little while later, he's walking along and he suddenly spots her in the beauty section holding a tub of skin cream. And he says, oh, what have we here? And she says, it's a wonderful skin cream. It's only $20 and 
and it makes me look beautiful, she says to him, hopefully. And he reaches to take the cream from her hands and he says, so will a case of beer and it's half the price. <laughs> We don't need beer or skin cream. We just need to look beneath the surface to the common soul within, and we'll come to discover the beauty in one another. To be sure, you know, this phenomenon extends itself into every sphere of Jewish living, even in the context of prayer as well. The Talmud observes that collective prayer has such supreme value and power of overturning negative decrees. And that's why you'll find that most of our prayer is always written in the plural form. But here's the problem. We find so many scenarios in the scriptures and beyond of Jews who were in peril, and they prayed together, and yet they aren't spared. What happened to the power of communal prayer? And yet the hard fact is, when you look at those scenarios, they're not communal prayer. You see, you can have 500 people on a boat that is at risk of sinking, they can all be pouring out their hearts, but each one is only thinking about number one. You could have a thousand people in a shul and yom kippur, but each one is only focused on entirely him or herself. Is that communal prayer? Is that real unity? It's actually 500 people dovening in one room, but in essence, each one only for themselves. You know, what's the beginning? What's the beginning of every Jewish conversation? Shalom Aleichem, Aleichem Shalom. Imagine, I meet you, and I begin with, good morning, and you reply, morning good. I mean, isn't after all, that's how Jews function? On the surface, it seems cordial, but beneath, there's something else going on. The moment someone tells you, shalom aleichem, your instinctive reaction is, no, no, you got it wrong, it's the other way around, aleichem shalom. If you concern yourself only with your own welfare, if you pray only for yourself, if you study only for yourself, if you involve yourself only with your own perspective, only with your own particular issues, then that's not real unity, even if a whole bunch of you might be doing it all at the same time, as a hundred other people. The rabbis in the Medrash ask an unusual question. What defines us as a holy nation? From where do we derive this principle? And they answer, citing a verse in Deuteronomy, who is like your nation Israel, one nation in the land. And the immediate and obvious question is, there's no word of holiness in that passage. You want to bring a verse that emphasizes that we are a holy nation. How do you know we're a holy nation? Because at Sinai, God proclaimed us as Mamlechas Kohanim, a kingdom of priests, Viga Kodesh, and a holy nation. Why are the rabbis bringing in this altogether different verse that makes no reference to holiness whatsoever? And yet here again, the rabbis in doing so are conveying a paramount lesson. Sure, God declared us as holy at Sinai, but the question was, what defines us as a holy nation? What do we need to do to retain that title, to maintain that stature, to live up to that ideal? O mikam cho Yisrael, who is like your nation Israel? Go echad ba'aretz, one nation in the land. It's the oneness, the unity that characterizes us and makes us holy. If you're committed to the bigger picture, that is Am Yisrael, if you have the right frame of mind, as much as it may be about the self, and that is your entitlement, and it, could, and it should always and no less be about the other as well. If you recognize that in unity, the you comes before I, if you appreciate that as much as you are asking for health, wealth, and all things good for yourself, and again, that is your entitlement, but you're also asking the same for your fellow, that is Go'echot Ba'aretz, that is a united nation, a united land under one God. That is what makes you and me worthy of the accolade of holy nation. That's when our prayers get properly answered. In fact, as a holy nation, what are we called? What are we called? We're not called the children of Abraham. We're not called the children of Isaac. We're not even called the children of Jacob. We're called B'nai Yisrael, the children of Yisrael. Why is that the deliberate title? Chosen to identify the Jewish people for two reasons. First, because the word Yisrael, the name Yisrael is an acronym. For Yesh, Shishim, Riba, Osya, Slatera, there are 600,000 letters in the Torah. What does the number of letters in a Torah scroll have to do with the Jewish people? Plain and simply put, because if one letter of a Torah were to become cracked or erased, it affects the totality of the entire Torah. And similarly, if one Jew goes astray, we don't turn around and say it's his or her problem, it becomes our collective problem. 
And the second point is, because when you look at the word Yisrael, the Yud of Yisrael stands for Yitzchak and Yaakov. The Sin, Yisrael, stands for Sarah. The Resh of Yisrael stands for Rivka and Rachel. The Aleph of Yisrael stands for Avraham. And finally, the Lamed of Yisrael stands for Leah. All of our patriarchs, all of our matriarchs are rooted in our very identity. As part of Am Yisrael and the progeny of our forebears, we never walk alone. We all stem from the same source. We are all invariably brothers and sisters, and as such, we all remain inextricably linked to one another. It's not his problem or her problem, it's our problem. So I want to finish on a, on a final point. A scenario we can all relate to. You do something nasty to a friend, to a loved one. And later, of course, you go along and you apologize. I'm so sorry. I honestly don't know what came over me. You know me. This isn't like me at all. I just wasn't being myself. What does it mean that you weren't yourself? It means what we all know to be true because we all know this about ourselves that there is a real self and there is the, shall we say, unreal self. The unreal self may act cruelly or stupidly or both. The real self would never do anything to hurt a friend or a loved one or anyone else for that matter. There was a study that was done at UCL, University College of London, where it was determined that love and hate are intimately linked within the human brain. Scientists studying the physical nature of hate found that some of the nervous circuits in the brain responsible for it are the same as those that are used during the feelings of romantic love. Although, of course, love and hate appear to be polar opposites. And a brain scanner was used to investigate the neural circuits that become active when people look at the photograph of someone they say they hate as the hate circuit, which shares something in common with the love circuit. So this professor, Samir Zeki, who led the study, explained that the findings might explain why both hate and romantic love can result in similar, sometimes extreme behavior, both heroic as well as evil. How can two opposite sentiments lead to the same sort of behavior? And the study advertised for volunteers to take part of the study, and 17 people were chosen randomly. But these were people who had to be scrutinized and analyzed, and they all professed a deep hatred for at least one individual. A number of them chose an ex-lover. Some chose a competitor at work. I don't know if anybody chose their own rabbi. But I can tell you, one woman expressed an intense hatred for a famous political figure. And Professor Zeki and another individual, John Ramaya of the Welcome Laboratory of Neurobiology analyzed the activity of the neural circuits in the brain that lit up when the volunteers were viewing photos of that hated person. They found that the hate circuit includes part of the brain called the putamen and insula, found in the subcortex of the brain. Both were activated by hate as well as romantic love. But here's the most compelling bit of all. One major difference between the love and hate appears to be in the fact that large parts of the cerebral cortex associated with where we make our judgments became deactivated during love, whereas only a small area became deactivated in hate. Now, what does all that mean? Plain and simply put, it suggests that there's a fine line between love and hate. But whereas with love, one tends to be far less critical and judgmental regarding a loved person, it is more likely that in the context of the hate emotions, those are underpinned by a judgmental attitude. Or as the report concluded, there remains one big difference between love and hate. Whilst romantic love is directed at just one person, hate can target numbers of individuals or groups defined by their race, gender, social or cultural background, or political beliefs. In other words, we hate because we judge. And we judge because we label. And if we can get past the labels and the judgment, then we could learn to love people so much more.
Finally, here's what Hasidism has to say about it. Not looking at the brain, but looking at the soul. The Friedrich Rebbe, the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, made a compelling observation once in the name of the Baal Shem Tov. He said there are essentially two times that the etzem hanashama, the essence of your soul, truly shines forth. One is when there is tsar, when there is pain, and the other is when there is simcha, when there is joy. That is to say, when a person is in pain, for example, after a loss of a loved one, God forbid, or illness or what have you, other people flock forth to help that person to alleviate the pain. Conversely, when someone is in a state of joy, like after having a baby or whenever other celebrating some other great occasion, then he feels compelled to reach out to many others and simply draw them into his celebration. So note the distinction. When a person is in pain, others reach out to him. When someone is in joy, he reaches out to others. And the point is that the fluctuations of life, at the core, our souls are always expressing their true selves by reaching out to others and interacting with others. And here's the key. Everything else in between, said the Friedrich Rebbe, is the tchum of the Eight Sahara. Simply put, the devil's playground, the devil's workshop. Therefore, he said, it is incumbent upon a person to strive to always be in a state of joy and express his true essence. And in practical terms, what that means is that you never walk alone. You are either reaching out to other people when you are in a state of joy, or you are reaching out to other people when you see them in a state of pain. There's no middle ground. There's no room for ambivalence or for indifference. Your job, the way your soul truly expresses itself, is only when you are bonding with others. Anything else is not the real you. It's the tchum of the Sahara. It's the devil's workshop. Friends, a man walked into a bar and they asked the bartender for a drink. And then he asked for another, and then another, and by the time he downed his sixth one, the bartender was so concerned, he said, is everything okay? And he looked at him and he said, you know, my wife and I, we got into a terrible fight, and she said she's not gonna speak to me now for a whole month. And the bartender leaned over and asked rather cynically, and that's a bad thing? To which the man replied, yeah, today's the last day of the month. <laughs> may Moshiach come this year, and may we already live as if he has, by disbanding immediately with the judgmental and the strife and the labeling, and live with only true gratuitous love, a mutual respect for one another. We have to disband with the hate and break down the barriers that impedes our communication with one another. Let this indeed be the last day indeed of our negativism and the first day of new beginnings, of new love and amity such that then we will result in meriting that day when the whole world will once again live in perfect harmony. Thank you.